Um, my title is actually more aspirational than it is an, an accomplishment, because I, I thought I was going to say something about that. But as is often the case when I work on sellers, I always run into problems that need to be worked out on the way. And I'm not sure how far I got, but we'll see what happens. Um, so I do want to do a couple of things uh, in this paper. Uh, I want to elaborate and defend the claim that I made in my book, Welford Sellers, that the notion of practical reality is a significant uh, addition to our conceptual arsenal and deserves to, oh, that's better, and deserves to be taken seriously in thinking about what it means to be a realist in a Salarzian co context. Among other things, this calls for a renewed consideration of Sellers' treatment of causation and the laws uh, of nature. Causation and practical reality come together as topics for me because Sellers was very fond of the platonic dictum <clears throat> that to be is to have power. <clears throat> uh, in, in classically, I actually looked through some of the literature, and I don't see that he's got that actually out in, in, in any of the printed stuff. But in class, he did it, mentioned it a lot. Uh, so uh, and a major reason I think he defends uh, scientific realism is that in his view, science is the best road to knowledge of the law-like or causal structure of the world and thus the best road to knowledge of the real, because he thinks those are connected. If the notion of practical reality is going to do something more than make sense, it is going to have to illuminate something about our world for us. It will have to be tied to causation, for this will be what validates calling it a form of reality, I think. It's surprising, though, I think, how little Sellers actually says about these important topics. And that puts all the greater burden to think about such matters on those of us who want to exploit Salarzian thought as a base camp from which to explore further the philosophical territory. In this essay, I can only get us into the foothills from which a serious expedition into the causal articulation of practical reality would have to be launched. So why practical reality? Um, let me begin by recapping why I introduced the notion of practical reality and the problems I hoped it would help us solve. Sellers draws a now familiar distinction between the manifest image and the scientific image of humans in the world. The manifest image, I mean, this is going to be old hat to, I think, just about everyone here. The manifest image is the conceptual framework in terms of which we came to understand ourselves as persons and in terms of which, at the present time, we ordinarily comprehend our nature and our place in the world. The scientific image contrasts with the manifest image insofar as it employs postulational methods in developing theories to explain the way the world wags. This image, the scientific image, according to Sellers, is still a borning. It is yet partial and gappy, however full of promise it may be. But Sellers also thinks that as it matures and is fleshed out, it will come to challenge and eventually replace the manifest image. I've argued elsewhere that the description Sellers gives us of this replacement process in philosophy and the scientific Im image of man actually goes off track. It would be better to say that the descriptive and explanatory resources of the sciences will come to displace the descriptive and explanatory resources currently available in the manifest image, what Sellers calls the descriptive ontology of everyday life. This means that the prescriptive, am I staying coordinated? Yeah, Woo. This means that the prescriptive and justificatory resources of the manifest image will remain in place. There would thus have to be a mutual accommodation of the ontology science drives us to adopt and our conception of ourselves and the world in which we act as agents. But the problem becomes evident, for the descriptive ontology of science doesn't quite match up with the prescriptive ontology of agency in two different dimensions. First, person is not a scientifically natural kind. So agents will not be salient objects in the scientific image. Second, nor will be many of the aims and objects of our agency. The tools and utensils that facilitate our lives, the social structures and practices that organize our activities, the fashions that entrance us, the art that inspires us, the activities that constitute a meaningful, flourishing life, none of these, as far as I can see, will be salient entities or cogently describable in the scientific image. I see no reason to believe that there will be any adequate reconstruction in the terms of pure scientific theory of many of the characteristics that make these objects and activities items of concern to us. Sellers seems to think that we could learn to live our lives in terms that have hardcore scientific credentials, 
using that vocabulary to formulate the individual and community intentions that form the basis of our agency. And, well, that seems implausible to me at best. Suppose we were to, as he says it in um, uh, SRI, abandon the framework of common sense and use only the framework of theoretical science. How then would objects like voting machines or Klaus Oldenburg sculptures and activities like playing Hamlet or arguing before a court show up for us? They are themselves deeply enmeshed in complex normative structures and practices. In order to describe those uh, things within our scientific framework, we'd have to describe the individual and community intentions on which such normative structures and practices are founded. But we'd have to be able to do so, again, using just the vocabulary of the framework of theoretical science. Currently, of course, the intentions that underwrite the structure, for instance, of voting or of the arts or of legal argument are framed in common sense terms. Well, that would all have to change, apparently. Thinkers, uh, Sellers thinks he has a story about this. He does not think that we would have to reconstruct de novo scientific descriptions of socially constructed objects and activities. Rather, he thinks that part of the move to a thoroughgoing or to a thoroughly scientific framework would include our ceasing to use such manifest image terms as vote, election, play, and act in favor of mentioning them. Rather than the intention, I shall vote, I would adopt an intention that is something like, I shall engage in the activity called voting, in which case I don't have to commit myself to actually voting. <laughs> um, <laughs> as sellers might display it, we'll move from intentions like, shall I vote, to intentions like, whoops, shall I vote. Uh, this move allows for sociolinguistic constitution of the objects and activities I engage without presuming their reality as such. I think it's sort of like the difference between I saw the witch on the moors last night versus I saw the person we call a witch on the moors last night. Another way to describe this is to say that we would systematically adopt an anthropological stance towards the social structures and practices that organize our world refusing to commit ourselves to the literal truth of the ordinary first order descriptive assertions made in the language of the manifest image. And this idea now seems muddled to me. I don't mean that one cannot adopt an anthropological stance towards the social structures and practices in which one is enmeshed. But I do not think that one could always adopt such a stance towards them or that the anthropological stance could be one's only perspective on them. First off, I don't see how the use and not the mere mention of the first person pronoun or some equivalent could be avoided. My intentions will always be my intentions, not just the intentions called mine. Who would call them mine if not me? I do not think that the intention at hand should be expressed as shall I vote where I'm mentioning both myself and my activity. In Seller's own definition of his shawl operator, indeed, a first person reference is built into it, precisely because it is expressive rather than descriptive. Second, I cannot see how I could live life as a self-interested but moral agent without committing myself to the literal truth of the descriptions and assessments by which the world is organized for me. Not even the most POMO of us is that ironic. <laughs> to a pragmatist especially, the notion of an ontological commitment is not the notion of a merely theoretical conjecture. It involves taking a stand and fundamentally structures one's agency. Prying commitment and agency too far apart empties them, I think, of, empties them both of their senses. And third, in order for the intention I shall engage in the activity called voting to make sense to me. Someone would still have to be using the term vote in other contexts. I suppose we could amend the intention to account for having abandoned the framework of common sense. So I shall engage, oops, oops, I go back. I shall engage in the activity formerly called voting. Uh, and, well, this might have a certain rock star quality to it, 
but I don't think it's in the long run a very attractive position. Again, someone would still have to command the proper use of voting to be able to make sense out of that description. Having wholeheartedly made the move into the framework of the theoretical sciences, almost everything of consequence to us would have to be thought of as the thing formerly called X, and I don't think that we can sensibly uh, do that. Of course, we can opportunistically avail ourselves of languages that we don't command. A non-German speaker uh, can remark that sitting around the dining room table sharing food, drinking conversation with dear friends is the kind of thing the Germans call gemütlich. Similarly, one might talk about the phenomenon scientists call the collapse of the wave packet without having a whole lot of understanding of quantum theory. But as far as I can see, in the situation we are now envisioning, the framework and the language of the manifest image would still have to be more than familiar to the denizens of the brave new world of the scientific image. They would have to know how most of these objects <coughs> and activities, they, sorry, <coughs> They would have to know how most of the objects and activities they engage would have to be described in the manifest image terms and what the consequences of such descriptions would be. They would have to know, that is, not just the ifs, uh, not just the ises and mostlies, as it were, but the wouldas and shouldas of the things and the activities they engage. Okay. Uh, thus, they would effectively still have to speak manifest. I suspect, in fact, that the ontogeny, uh, that ontogeny would have to recapitulate phylogeny, phylogeny, at least to the extent that individuals could not learn the fine-grained language of scientific theory unless they first acquired the coarser and normatively loaded language of the manifest image. I admit I don't have any a priori argument for that. It's an empirical claim. Uh, and, of course, it's one that there's no probably ethical way to test, so I'll just assume it. <clears throat> so I think these points follow from an honest and thoroughgoing pragmatism. Part of the pragmatism is the acknowledgement that words and concepts are tools, and they are thus naturally infected with the human interests that they serve. Science is, among other things, an effort to develop words and concepts, ways of speaking and thinking that minimize the direct stamp of human interests so that we approach ever closer to an understanding of what things are rather than merely what they are for us. But we cannot, and therefore should not, entirely abandon the for us. We should not lose our grip on the world nor our recognition of the world's grip on us. It was reflections along these lines that led me to propose that we take seriously the concept of practical reality as a third concept matched up and contrasted with con concepts of empirical reality and transcendental reality. I admit, the terminologies, terminology is not perfect. The real ideal distinction, which in the context of the empirical versus the transcendental, is supposed to be the distinction between the mind dependent and the mind independent, doesn't like doing that job when it's put together with practical. If you talk about practical ideality or the practically ideal, uh, those sound like you know, the highest of goals against which the practically real is, well, something of a come down. But that's not the usage uh, I intend. My talk of practical reality of things and activities um, is claimed or is aimed to express belief in the truth and objectivity of the prescriptive or the normative aspects of such things. Practical ideality, in contrast, would then express the subjectivity of the normative or prescriptive. This is, I think, a fairly minimal sense of real. It'll be familiar to Brandom's, uh, readers of Brandom's recent book, From Empiricism to Expressivism, where he defends a modal realism that he characterizes as the conjunction of three claims. MR1, some modally qualified claims are true, those that are state facts, and some of those facts are objective in the sense that they are independent of the activities of concept users. They would be facts even if there never were or never had been concept users. So we can characterize practical reality by adapting these claims. That's kind of slow. So practical reality, um, 
will uh, just, you know, do the transformation on the claim. Some pre prescriptive claims are true. Those that are state facts. Uh, and some of those facts are objective in the sense that they are independent of the actual activities of concept users. users. They are subjectively robust and would remain facts even if agents did not exist. Thou shalt not kill, as it were. So, described thusly, uh, it seems pretty clear that Sellers was a practical realist. He is explicit that on his conception, truth is a genus that accompanies such species as empirical truth, mathematical truth, and moral truth. That's in uh, chapter four of Science and Metaphysics. He's equally explicit uh, that fact talk is just material mode truth talk, so necessarily true claims state facts. Finally, uh, as I read it, the final chapter of Science and Metaphysics is a search for grounds to claim the objectivity of morality. It's not clear he actually thinks he succeeds there, but he, because uh, he admits it remains incomplete, but at least his goal is unmistakable. He would like uh, to uh, claim them to be objective. So the claim that Sellers is a practical realist has got to be somewhat uh, surprising, I think. Doesn't it clash directly with his strongly self-professed scientific realism? And my argument is that it need not do so. Part of the reason there is no conflict here is that I think the kind of realism in question is actually fairly minimal. Uh, Bob calls it a robust realism. I'm, I'm not so sure I buy that adjective uh, there. The physical or scientific realism that Sellers defends is surely more robust than those three sentences alone. And thinking about how much more robust a re realism Sellers defends in empirical matters has led me to uh, try to think more thoroughly about causation in Sellers' thoughts. So this is getting you off to why I started thinking more about causation in the context of the practical. So the kind of realism we looked at seems as I said, minimal. It is extremely permissive. So consider uh, some claims about unicorns are true, uh, those that are state facts, and some of those facts are objective in the sense that they are independent of the activities of concept users. They would be facts even if there never were or never had been concept users. Uh, I take it that all these uh, uh, principles of unicorn realism are true, for unicorns are indeed mythical creatures. That's a true fact stating and entirely objective claim. Yet, unicorn realism is, I think, not widely endorsed in the profession. Uh, if the existence of any true objective claims about something or using some qualifier is sufficient for realism, realism then the existence of true objective claims of non-existence would seem to suffice to establish reality in the same breath that they deny existence. And I, I can envision two responses here. Um, one is that there's a difference between alethic modal claims about mind-independent objects and either prescriptive claims or claims about unicorns, because in the latter two cases, the existence of concept users is non-trivially involved in the truth conditions of the claims, so that the third clause of the analysis does not, in such cases, turn out to be true, because, you know, unicorns, if there weren't people to think of unicorns, well, they still wouldn't exist, as far as I can tell. So. so if there were no concept users, there would be no agents and no prescriptive claims would be true or state facts. If there were no concept users, they would not even be the concept of a unicorn, since there are, and since there are no unicorns, nothing about unicorns would be true. But, you know, there would still be claims of the form uh, if there were concept users, there would be agents and those agents ought to behave rationally. And if there were concept users and they had the concept of a unicorn, they would recognize that unicorns have a single horn is true. So I think, uh, as far as I can see, once Brandom has opened the floodgates of conceptual realism, uh, it's hard really to keep much of anything out. I think a slightly more sophisticated response would be something like this. The claims Brandom is focused on are not about modalities. They, they actually use modal qualifiers. His realism is read off the form and not the content of the claims in question. We can, of course, construct uh, 
other claims whose content concerns the forms of the claims we are primarily interested in, such sentences would make explicit what is expressed via the forms of the claims we are immediately concerned with, but those metalinguistic claims, even if they are only very abstractly or indirectly metalinguistic, are not the datum from which he infers, I think, his modal realism. The fundamental assumption, though, it seems to me, is that the formal features of language reflect real structural features of the world. If talk about categories makes explicit the formal features of our language and thought, then by Brandom's lights, we should be categorical realists. He pretty much says that, I think. But I think that this is not, in fact, the Salarzian move. In, in Seller's view, categories are highest conceptual kinds, and there is no straightforward inference from the structure of our conceptual framework to the structure of the world. Indeed, as I've argued elsewhere, uh, it is precisely to, to avoid insisting on some form of, quote, semantic government of claimings by facts with which they, quote, correspond, that prompted Sellers to develop his conception of the non-semantic picturing relation between some claimings and some objects in the world. My inclination, thus, is to suspect that Brandom is hoping to get more ontological bang out of his semantic buck than he should, especially given his own professed pragmatism. If Sellers is right to think that semantic terms always perform the task of classifying the functional role of linguistic conceptual items in a broader linguistic economy that includes agency, then no ontological conclusions follow simply from the correct application of a semantic term such as, for instance, true or fact. <clears throat> There's a long but I think unfortunate history of trying to establish a criterion in ontology that would be either simply syntactic, such as being a proper or maybe a logically proper name, or semantic, such as being the value of a variable of quantification. But quite frankly, I think all such attempts are doomed to failure. The real measure for ontology is not to be found in either syntax or semantics. It is indeed pragmatic, and not in the thin linguistic sense of pragmatic. As I remarked in my introduction, Sellers often cited with approval the passage from the sophist in which the stranger offers a definition of being in terms of the capacity, the dunamis, to do something to something else or to be affected by something else. What we're really committed to ontologically are the things that we count on and take account of in coping with the world, even if some of that activity is in the highly rarefied context of experimentation. It's not an accident that Peirce's pragmatic maxim mentions the effects of the objects of our conceptions, nor does Peirce have in mind merely inferential effects. Thus again, I take my point to fit with a more thoroughgoing pragmatism. What this means for us is that the quick and dirty argument for practical realism I offered just before cannot be taken to settle the issue. In order to make the case convincingly, I think we have to investigate the practical effects of the practical. Serious consideration of the practical effects of the practical means looking for whether there is good reason to believe that the objects and activities in their practical guise as normatively constituted or qualified can be properly said to be causally efficacious or explanatory. The story I tell here can only prepare the ground for a fuller argument to the effect that practical kinds of objects and activities, that is, objects and activities whose kind is determined to an important degree by their practical standing, have a perfectly legitimate claim to reality in Seller's world. This is because, as a preliminary to that fuller argument, we need to defend the uh, respectability of kind talk in ontological context from what is ultimately a Solarzian attack. So the story I'm going to reconstruct will bring us face to face, face to face with some but not all of the more heterodox positions that Sellers espouses. Being hetero heterodox, of course, is not a way of being false. I am far from sure that the position Sellers ends up with is coherent, but I do think that the most obvious moves that would ensure coherence are moves in the direction I'm recommending, at least that's my hope. So 
Brandom's work has certainly brought to the fore the fact that Sellers believes that a crucial constitutive uh, determinant of the meaning of lingual conceptual items are the inferential proprieties that, are involved, that they are involved in, where these inferential proprieties include both the properties of formal inferences, such as modus ponens, and, of course, material inferences uh, or material inferential proprieties. We commonly get two different kinds of examples of materially good inference. And actually, I think it was Rio uh, uh, pointed another one out that I, I hadn't taken account of, so I'm not quite sure what to do with that yet. One kind is the inference from a determinate to a determinable, from X is blue uh, to X is colored. He pointed out that, of course, there's a good uh, material inference from X is colored to X is extended, and that's not a determinate, determinable uh, kind of relation. Nor is it a color, a causal relation, because the other standard examples that uh, Sellers uses are, in fact, causal relations. He mentions, it is raining, so the streets will be wet, or this turns litmus paper red, therefore it's an acid. Uh, those are his examples. Both kinds of examples can provide evidence that meanings and inferences are connected. Both demonstrate ways in which inferential connections serve to locate claims in a logical space of reasons, but they are significantly different in other ways. And Sellers doesn't really say much about this in inference and meaning. He just sort of drops the examples and moves on. Uh, so for some uh, pfft, illumination, I think we have to turn uh, to counterfactualist dispositions in the causal modalities. And one is always a little bit wary when one turns to that essay. <clears throat> One thing Sellers says there, and that Brandom emphasizes, is that description and explanation always go together. And here's a nice quote. Although describing and explaining, predicting, retrodicting, understanding are distinguishable, they are also, in an important sense, inseparable. It is only because the expressions in terms of which we describe objects locate these objects in a space of implications that they describe at all rather than merely label. The descriptive and explanatory resources of language advance hand in hand. This is indeed just another way of making the point that inference and meaning are intrinsically tied. But it also serves to bring to our attention the significance of the subjunctive mood and modal language. For good explanations rarely take the form of materially valid inferences in an extensional first order language, despite the common use of such inferences as models of explanation. To make a first hand use, this is another quote from CDCM, to make first hand use of these modal expressions is to be about the business of explaining a state of affairs or justifying an assertion. This is a significant claim for the positivist view, at least as I understand it, had been that the explanatory burden uh, in most uh, scientific explanations is carried by the unrestricted generality of the law. And Sellers is denying that. Indeed, the generality of some kind is always present in an explanation, so it's easy to think that something like, if the match had been dry when you struck it, it would have ignited, simply depends on the general claim that all dry matches, perhaps caterers paribus, ignite when struck, but the appropriate presence of a subjunctive in such a claim uh, does not, in fact, of course, depend solely on the generality. Sellers thinks that the ubiquitous use of modals and subjunctives in explanatory contexts is neither an accident nor a mere decoration of language. They have an expressive role that plays an important part in the practices of explanation and justification. We need to understand that role in order to move forward in our attempt to understand the practical effects of the practical. So it's not generalization as such that supports the counterfactuals or subjunctives that show up in explanatory contexts. Let's call general statements that do support counterfactuals and subjunctives law-like statements, what Sellers calls them in CDCM. What job do they do that is signaled by putting such a statement in the subjunctive or attaching a modal qualifier to it? Brandon would have it that the presence of the subjunctive or modality singles that they are describing a different kind of fact from an ordinary empirical fact. They are describing a modal fact. And he works to construct an extended sense of descriptive that would enable us to apply a term, to apply that term to such statements. But I think it's pretty clear that Sellers would not follow him in that. He's, Bob's gone off in a 
in his own direction there. Sellers says, to sum up, law-like statements are not a special case of descriptive all statements. In particular, they are not descriptive all statements which are unrestricted in scope, that is, not localized by reference to particular places, times, or objects. So what do sellers think is really going on when we assert law-like statements or use a counterfactual or subjunctive in an explanation? Well, he tells us, it is therefore important to realize that the presence in the object language of the causal modalities and of the logical modalities and of the deontic modalities serves not only to express existing commitments, but also to provide the framework for the thinking by which we reason our way in a manner appropriate to the specific subject matter into the making of new commitments and the abandoning of old. Um, there's a lot built into that thought, uh, and it comes at the end of a very long essay. So let me take a moment to try and unpack it some. In order to fully understand Seller's somewhat unorthodox approach to these matters, we need to understand how he thinks of inductive inquiry generally. And he sums that up nicely in a catchword. The motto of the age of science might well be natural philosophers have hitherto sought to understand meanings, but the task is to change them. So science, in his view, is a rigorous method for systematically changing, revising our language, and therefore our concepts, and therefore our abilities to cope with the world. In part, this means changing the inferential proprieties involving the terms and the concepts we use. So take either a law-like statement, perhaps to every action there is an equal and opposite reaction, or a statement containing an explicit causal modality, say, if the books hit 451 degrees Fahrenheit, necessarily they'll start to burn. And Sellers tells us that scientific terms have, as part of their logic, a line of retreat as well as a plan of advance. These lines of retreat and advance are not themselves to be cashed out, I think, directly in terms of standing inferential proprieties. We wouldn't necessarily know which, going forward, which new inferential proprieties to add but rather in terms of susceptibility to subject matter dependent methodologies. That's how I construe it. There are particular ways to go about jeopardizing, extending, retracting, and revising the inferential proprieties that license appropriate use of empirical and theoretical terms. So law-like statements that play an explanatory role cannot be singled out by any syntactic markers that I know of. Sellers points to the pragmatic st status we accord them that explains how they function. We willingly project them into unobserved situations precisely because we have come to assert or believe them on the basis, well, we hope, of appropriate, well-executed inductive methods. It's that background reliance on inductive methodology combined with sophisticated logical mathematical analysis that distinguishes for instance, uh, to every action there is an equal and opposite reaction from, uh, from to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. In understanding both these assertions, we grasp implicitly that there are different routes leading to acceptance of the claims and different routes involved in revising or rejecting them. Similarly, the commitment made to each, whether to Newton's law or to the Weltanschauung of Ecclesiastes, has a different tenor to it. One pretty clearly seems to express a law of nature, the other perhaps a natural law in a very different sense. At least some, so some people hope. Inference from generalization is rarely deeply explanatory, explanatory on its own, precisely because it is thin in contrast to inferences from law-like statements that we take to have modal or subjunctive force. The latter, however, are thick because the logical space in which they place things has extensive horizons and a significant infrastructure, a history, and a future. Appropriate and inappropriate methodologies, a penumbra of possibilities that, though not described, are conveyed in ways that enrich our understanding and guide our ability to go on. 
It is in the demand for explanation and the ability to meet that demand that the regulative ideal unity of a conceptual framework and the measure of its real success can be found. So I said I'm particularly concerned here with causation because the causal and the real are connected for sellers. And I want eventually to show that the kinds of things that are identified in part by their normative statuses can nonetheless be considered real on a plausible interpretation of sellers' naturalism. Actually, I don't get to that in this paper, but hopefully life continues. But <clears throat> that turns out uh, to be surprisingly a bit misleading. For in fact, causation uh, ultimately has a derivative status in Seller's system. And again, the text is CDCM. In Seller's view, as I read him, causal notions, properly so called, live in a very particular environment. It's an environment populated with thing kinds, dispositions, capacities, what is done, and what results. This environment, of course, has its roots in the manifest image but retains them even as the sciences grow insofar as the sciences themselves use causal explanation. Yet Seller's bottom line is that causal notions themselves will ultimately be dispensable. The laws of nature that science ultimately ends up with will have abandoned the categorical environment within which causation finds its niche. So given the hardcore naturalist construal of his doctrines, this would mean that the final scientific image of humanity in the world is not only beyond good and evil, but beyond causation as well. My argument, however, is that this simply goes too far. I've never fully understand, understood Seller's ideal process ontology. Uh, Johannes Eipt has tried numerous times to convince me that it all makes sense, but I must admit I, I, I still falter. And I think more and more that there is good reason for that. A proper conception of ontology need not drive us to those extremes. So as I've mentioned then, causal explanations in Seller's view essentially involve reference to the thing kinds that the relevant objects belong to. Sellers has a rich notion of thing kinds uh, for terms for thing kinds are not ordinary predicates, but they're common nouns and their grammar differs from adjectival and adverbial constructions. Things get complex quickly in thinking about the role uh, kind terms have in causal explanations because thing kinds usually have causal properties themselves among their distinguishing characteristics. And this is where I hope to pick up the thread of Seller's thought, for he thinks it is important to distinguish between the causal properties of a certain kind of thing and the theoretical explanation of the fact that it has these causal properties. For a while, causal generalizations about thing kinds provide perfectly sound explanations, right? They provide perfectly sound explanations. That's something I want you to remember. It is no accident that philosophers have been tempted to think that such a phenomenon as salt dissolving in water must, at bottom, or in principle, be a lawfully evolving process describable in purely episodic terms. But moving to such a process explanation that uses purely episodic terms means the abandonment of causation, at least as I know and love it. So such an ideal description, he tells us, would no longer, in the ordinary sense, be in causal terms, nor the laws be causal laws. And this is an, an echo of some Russell from, you know, what, 1912, I think. Though philosophers have often muddled the waters by extending the application of the terms cause and causal in such wise that any law of nature, at least any non-statistical law of nature, is a causal law. Any given mode of explanation might be such as to lead, quote, by its very nature, to new horizons, that is, to a new and different mode of explanation, to new uh, connections, uh, sorry, to new questions calling for new answers of a different kind. Again, that, that last phrase, to new questions calling for new answers of a different kind is a quote from CDCM. The thing kind based generalizations that usually underwrite our explanations point beyond themselves because thing kinds bunch rather than explain causal properties. We must learn to quote, appreciate the promissory note dimension of thing kinds expressions, unquote, 
we begin to get beyond the framework of manifest causation by moving to the micro level, but we only begin to get beyond it by moving to the micro level, at which many of the causal properties of molar thin kinds can be explained. We can explain at the micro level why the salt dissolves. But the narrative cannot stop there because uh, Sellers, belie uh, Sellers believes because micro theories themselves uh, characteristically postulate micro thin kinds which have fundamentally the same logic as molar thin kinds. Sellers wants us ultimately to get out of the thin kind business altogether. I'm not convinced that's the way to go. For one thing, I do not have any clear conception of just what it is that Sellers thinks we're aiming at and he rejects the effort to make good on his promissory note anytime soon. Uh, the conception of the world as a pure process, or as pure process, which is as old as Plato and as new as Minkowski, remains a regulative ideal. Not simply because we cannot hope to know the manifold content of the world in all its particularity, but because science has not yet achieved the very concepts in terms of which the, such a picture might be formulated. So just as Marx can only hint at the fundamental nature of the communist society to come, Sellers can only hint at the scientific millennium to come. Uh, actually, that's not such a big problem for me. Uh, what I find more problematic is his quick dismissal of his rivals. He tells us, only those philosophies, new realism, neo-Thomism, positivism, certain contemporary philosophies of common sense and ordinary usage, et cetera, which suppose that the final story of what there is must be built after submitting them to a process of epistemological smelting and refinement from concepts pertaining to the perceptible features of the everyday world and which mistake the methodological dependence of theoretical on observational discourse for an intrinsically second-class status with respect to the problems of ontology, only such people can suppose the contrary. That is, the manifest image can't be dispensed with. Now, I actually, I do think I've learned the lessons about the methodological but not ontological priority of the observation language, and I don't have any intentions of ensconcing some form of perceptual given either in my epistemology or in my ontology, uh, but, oops. Uh, the considerations that his rivals hold on to, but Sellers rejects, are noticed all on the input side of the epistemological process. So uh, I think we need to consider the output side as well. Sellers, I think, seems to have forgotten here his own belief that in the scientific image, we will not and will not be able to dispense with the language of individual and community intentions. I simply don't see uh, how we can preserve the la that language in the framework of pure processes. And there are two, process, two problems that I think I foresee here. The first, uh, and perhaps lesser problem, is that it seems inevitable that a view of the world as a battery of ultimate pure processes governed by laws of nature will be computationally intractable in real time for creatures like us. Maybe we can develop supercomputers that can handle it, but we probably won't um, uh, be able to do so. Uh, the bunching, I think, that thing kinds uh, or thing kind concepts uh, do turns out, I think, to be crucial. It introduces essential simplifications into our scheme that enable it to remain tractable while still offering perfectly sound explanations. Right? He said they're perfectly sound explanations. Empirically robust bunches of properties in thing kinds reveal something significant about the structure of the world. Even if the bunches permit, or maybe even demand, further explanation in terms of patterns of pure processes, we need not dismiss those patterns as not really real or as simply unreal or as even necessarily of secondary status. It's not clear to me. If we take seriously the pragmatic criterion of ontological commitment I've recommended, and I recognize it's pretty damn vague, then however far science may progress, it will remain the case that we must count on and take account of those groups of higher level patterns that form kinds, both natural and social. 
So I don't think I'm falling into a permissive relativism here, for we must still respect the demand that such kinds, as we recognize, afford us perfectly sound explanations that hold up under empirical scrutiny. The fact that they do afford such explanations tells us something significant about the ontological structure of our world. Another way to put my point is, I think, this. I, like Sellers, endorse a form of explanationism in ontology, but I don't endorse his explanatory monism. Good explanations come in many sizes and shapes, and each one tells us something important about the structure of the world. So I'm going to be uh, pluralistic in that regard. The second, and to my mind, still more serious problem, is that intentions have an ineluctable first-person reference built right into them. And as far as I can see, that's a reference to oneself as agent, which I have, which I have to construe here as a very special kind of thing. So the problem I see is that the conceptual framework ought to retain ontological priority because of its method, sorry, the problem I see is not that the conceptual framework ought to retain ontological priority because of its methodological priority in time, but that we cannot simply, quote, abandon the framework of common sense and use only the framework of uh, theoretical science, unquote, because we cannot use the framework of theoretical science, the framework within, within which some inferences and not others are legitimate, in which some descriptions and not others are proper, and in which some procedures are productive and useful and others are wrongheaded or wasteful, unless we retain the conception of ourselves as epistemic agents. Were we fully uh, to give ourselves over to a pure process view of reality, uh, yeah, there would still be laws of nature governing the occurrence of such pure processes, I gather, but there would be no us as salient features of the environment to recognize them. That agents and agency vanish from the point of view of a pure process view of the world ramifies, I think, through Seller's philosophy, so he should care about this. Recall, if you will, or if you can, the rather difficult discussion in Moron Givenness and Explanatory Coherence, one of his more pellucid creations, uh, concerning the answer uh, to the skeptical question, granted that we are in the framework that produces our empirical knowledge, how can we justify accepting it? Sellers tells us that the answer lies in the necessary connection between being in the framework of epistemic evaluation and being agents. Right? The answer is that since agency, to be effective, involves having reliable cognitive maps of ourselves and our environment, the concept of effective agency involves that of our IPM, that's introspective perceptual and memory judgments, being likely to be true, that is, to be correct mappings of ourselves and our circumstances. Notice then that if the above argument is sound, it is reasonable to accept what he calls MJ5. <coughs> IPM judgments are likely to be true simply on the ground that unless they are likely to be true, the concept of effective agency has no application. So my argument is that in the pure process view of the world, the concept of effective agency makes no sense. We don't know how to tack it onto the world um, and how to apply it. Um, and then it turns out the claims to knowledge turn out to be ungrounded. So in my view, then, Sellers' belief that there is a regulative ideal of a system of pure processes that informs science ends up being, in a way, self-stultifying. Its achievement would undermine everything done to achieve it. So if my argument here is right, then we are at the doorstep of the next problem. I told you I wouldn't get there. Showing that the kinds of thing kinds that show up in our practical deliberations can also show up in perfectly good causal explanations so that the justificatory structure of practical reason makes contact with the explanatory structures of empirical and theoretical reason. Uh, that task is obviously for some other day. Kevin. Thank you. The, the first one, you're, um, 
point that we cannot use the framework of science without maintaining the framework of agency. Um, in, which sense, in what sense is this saying more than what Sellers was already admitting at the end of Philosophy and the Scientific Image of Man, for example, where there he says, um, thus the conceptual framework of persons is not something that needs to be reconciled with the scientific image, but rather something to be joined to it. Um, uh, well, as I, as I said, uh, again, it went by fast in the paper, but I actually think that's the same thing. He seems to have forgotten okay. uh, when he you know, sort of has this pure process view uh, that nonetheless we'd have the right to employ, uh, he seems to have forgotten that. As, uh, and, and here's where maybe, you know, maybe finally Johanna will have a breakthrough and explain to me how it is that on the pure process view, we still get to think of ourselves as agents. But that's what I don't see. And, and he just seems to, you know, that doesn't get mentioned. But it should be. <laughs> it shouldn't be forgotten. Okay, fair enough. The uh, question I'm more interested in is, um, Trying to get clear on what you say that, um, what you mean when you say um, that what it, the real measure of ontology is not syntactic or semantic, but pragmatic. Right. Um, so in, in your book, in that last chapter that you were talking about, you suggest that for sellers, both the manifest framework and the scientific framework are transcendentally ideal and empirically real. Okay. And then today in the talk, you were suggesting that um, somehow we should not expect reality to be in terms of our concepts or our conceptual scheme. You said something along those lines, I think. No? Oh, um, well, I think there's, what I, what I said there is that, is that there's no straightforward inference from we have this conceptual framework, so the world must be like that, right? Because then you can't make the move from one conceptual framework to another. And since he thinks that's a good move, he can't, Without further, whoops, without further ado, just assume that we can, from our, uh, you know, analytic uh, endeavors, uh, making sense of our conceptual framework, just say, oh, so the world's like that. Right, but if we're, um, if these frameworks are empirically real, then we should expect them to ultimately reveal us a reality that is conceptually structured. Right, but remember, empirical reality, he thinks of, uh, you know, he thinks the, the manifest image, the world of the manifest image is a phenomenal realm. It's empirically real if you're operating with the manifest image. There are truths with respect to it, and, and you can um, employ perfectly sound procedures to validate at least many of the truths. Um, there are some questions the manifest image raises that he thinks it can't answer. That's why it pushes us beyond. But, but empirical reality, that point just means, yeah, we can, we can operate with it uh, and validate its use um, perceptually uh, and using empirical methods to, uh, you know, substantiate it and keep it going. Okay, I'll pass the microphone. I was just curious if the, um, um, uh, the, if pragmatics was supposed to take us beyond the empirical reality to something no, I don't. Was, I was trying to get what the yeah. why you were insisting that was the basic notion for ontology. That's all. Uh, I saw Jim as the. Uh, feel free to to just ignore me because I'm going to ask you about something you didn't talk about. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm actually really interested in 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 your promissory note about uh, saying that you want to show how uh, kind things that show up in our practical deliberations can also be sort of show up in our causal explanations. And I want you to, maybe you could tell us like how, you know, at least in outline what this is going to, not how you're going to cash it out, but what exactly you want to explain. Because, you know, Sellers has, a, has as far as I can tell, a pretty conventional account about sort of the causal impotence of the normative. You know, he says pretty explicitly in I think it's a semantical solution of the mind-body problem. The quote is something like, obligation enters the causal order only as the object of an intentional act. It's sort of like Jones thinks, feels that he ought to repay his debts. Of course, anything can be the object of an intentional state, even unicorns, right? Um, so, you know, it, right. I wonder, what is, what is entering the causal state? You know, if I say something like, you know, Kevin punched me in the face, he shouldn't have done that. Well, you know, what's, what's, in, the, what's in the causal, you know, Punches and faces are in the causal order, right? Yeah. But you know, is the shouldn't have? Is that what we're trying to put in the causal order? Because Sellers, I think, is pretty clear that that's not. 
the no, conflict. actually, I, I guess I'd, I'd like to, at least to begin with, avoid the moral uh, issues like that and start talking about things that have, as it were, normative dimensions, like hammers, right, the standard example. Um, uh, not, there are many things that can be hammered with that are not hammers. Um, and there are things you can do with hammers that are not hammering. Uh, but uh, describing the world uh, as containing hammers is, is not a misdescription. Um, so I, I'd like to start there. Um, and that's all I'm going to say because otherwise I'd have to write the paper I <laughs> promised I would write, but I'm not ready to do that here in public. <laughs> we saw Jim and then Boris and then Hugh. Thanks. Yeah, just on Jeremy's point there, well, one th uh, intentions are thoughts that have causal upshots, uh, ceteris yes. paribus, and, and norms are ultimately related to intentions, community intentions of a certain kind. But I wanted to ask, um, back to when you did this, it's just trying to clarify when you had the interesting thing about um, we'll mention but not use normative and uh, yeah. first personal vocabulary. Then you were reading that as sort of, therefore, that's lost in the, in the, uh, the I mean, when Sellers says. No, I don't think it's l lost. I mean, what do you mean by lost there? I'm here's not sure. a distinction. When in phenomenalism he says um, the first personal point of view is irreducible, he's, and then he says, uh, what he says is when we're trying to scientifically explain it, we'll mention it but not use it. He doesn't say, if we were operating in a scientific ontology where the objects are conceived, uh, we'll still use first. Right. First person will be ir irreducible. Okay. We'll be well, using it. Everything you wanted to preserve with agency would be pr preserved in using uh, the language. Yeah, except he keeps saying things like we can entirely replace the descriptive or sources of the manifest mm -hmm. image with those of the scientific but that's image. that's all object ontology and explanation. What, what he's saying is if you're going to explain what's going on, Scientifically, he, he, I'm not saying he can necessarily succeed in this, but he wants to say, you'll be saying the thought occurred that so-and-so had had this upshot. You'll be mentioning thoughts right. and, and the I and so on. But he still thinks you'll be using uh, first personal agential vocabulary and so on and normative vocabulary in this supposed ideal scientific ontology. All right. I mean, if if that's really what he means, then maybe some of my criticisms I've gone I've gone too far. Construed him uh, some of things some of the things he says a bit too literalistically. But but you shouldn't get yourself into trouble by saying things that taken literally get you into trouble. Um, so. <laughs> ah. Okay. Uh, yeah. We should talk about that. I. 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 I that was a, that by went, went by pretty quick, and I and I don't really have a great full story of that, but uh, maybe you can correct me. That'd be good. Geography demands actually that it's Hugh next, then Boris. Uh, apologies, Boris. Um, no problem, no. <laughs> Bill, thank you. That, that that was very nice. Um, my comment is just on what you said about Bob's robust modal realism, and I, I agree with you that it's. It's not as robust as Bob thinks it is by the standards of people who really go think of themselves as going in for big R robust metaphysics. Right. Um, and I know quite a lot of those folks. I mean, it may be as robust as we want. But. Yeah, exactly. And that brings me to what I want to say. As I understood it, your response to that was to say we could find a, a, a criterion for robust ontology in, um, in, in this sort of Eleatic criterion that Sellers seems attracted to, the, the idea that the, the really real things are the things make which, are, which, are, which make a difference, which are causes. What I want to suggest to you is an alternative way of going at that point, okay. which is to simply give up looking for uh, a, a robust criterion, to simply be deflationists um, uh, 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 about these ontological or metaphysical questions. And that's a way of going which it seems to me fits much better with your overall story. I mean, the well, I, you know, request for a practical I, I think actually that's, that's a view that I'm, I am increasingly attracted to. I, I guess I'm uh, reluctant to try and foist it onto Sellers because he, he does seem to want to be able to make ontological pronouncements that are fairly robust. No, I, I agree. So. But then the, the question is whether that's in the end a consistent position. Right. I mean, another thing he, he, he tries to use that Eliotic criterion for, 
is to distinguish between genuinely descriptive and and and, and non-descriptive. Right. But but then he gives up on that, um, and it may well be that he has to give up on it for this other purpose too. Well, yeah. I mean, I I I. You know, when I was young and brash, I was unabashed about thinking that, of course, one has to have a metaphysics, and of course, metaphysics is anything. And, and as I get older, I get more and more circumspect in my thinking that, uh, and my ability to understand what some of the current crop of metaphysicians think they're on about. So, um, yeah, I would love to be able to elaborate a good story in which we deflate the hell out of that and say, ho hum, there you go again when they start spinning off. Uh, Good. So and this, this will fit in very nicely with what I want to talk about tomorrow. Good. Good. I would like to get back to your opening remarks about the anthropological standpoints. Um, mm -hmm. What would you um, say to the idea that for Sellers um, such an anthropological standpoint would be um, essentially the ideal for the um, some sort of an ideal for the philosopher who aspires to become um, uh, to become uh, reflectively at home and the full complexity of um, the multidimensional conceptual systems in terms of which we suffer, think, and act, as Sellers puts it in um, SK. Um, you know, Sellers was quite aware that we cannot um, fully live up to the ideals we espouse. This is um, a recurrent theme in his um, writings on practical philosophy. And so perhaps our practical inability to live our lives from the vantage points of um, such an anthropological standpoint wouldn't in a way really matter because we as, um, as humans, as practical beings, simply aren't philosophers through and through. And because of that cannot be um, um, uh, 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 cannot be judged by such a philosophical ideal. But um, the idea would be that as philosophers, our, um, we, we would, so to speak, be committed to a reflective attitude towards practical reality. And then um, I have just um, a very quick second question. Um, uh, as, as far as I understand it, um, such an anthropological standpoint would come down to something like this, um, um, that, that we should explicate conceptual norms against the background of the scientific image. And uh, when we take this as our starting point, um, then um, one way to deal with all um, the problems you've pointed out would perhaps be um, to, to say that according to Sellers, um, these problems simply have to be, um, yeah, to, to be transformed or transposed into the, the formal mode. Again, I mean, um, um, uh, Sellers thinks that our talk about causal modality is in a way just um, uh, just a way to talk about um, uh, conceptual norms, to talk about um, inference principles, but um, this mode of talking about conceptual norms is transposed into the material mode. And perhaps um, Sellers' way out of um, at least some of the problems you've pointed out would be uh, just to re-transpose um, uh, yeah, these these way of talkings back into the formal mode again. I, I guess my the reason I'm reluctant to see things that way, particularly with regard to your first question, is that that makes philosophy an entirely theoretical discipline, and you know there's this long-standing wisdom tradition in philosophy where you know philosophy is supposed to actually have an effect on your life. It's supposed to help you become a better person. I must admit, it doesn't seem to be strikingly effective in that, in many <laughs> regards. But it's supposed to, right? And, and I don't want to you know, say that, well, yeah, that's all confusion. All we really want in philosophy is to get the theory right, is to have the right uh, theory. Um, so I'm, uh, and, and, I, I, and, and I have trouble believing that I could adopt this thoroughgoing anthropological um, point of view where I sort of can distance myself from even the values I espouse and, and as it were, know how to get, on, get along in the world. Um, so I, I, I want to resist that. I think philosophy is uh, 
uh, not purely theoretical. There is such a thing as practical philosophy, and um, and by thinking you know much more thoroughly about it, maybe we could even get a little bit better at doing it. Um, maybe not. Uh, so is that. Okay. Mark. Bill, thanks for a great paper. Um, I work in metaethics, and I, so hearing you talking about practical reality um, is kind of thrilling. Um, but I had a question about the way that you uh, cut the crucial distinction in understanding what that's about as yeah. being a distinction between practical reality and practical ideality, I guess, um, as being as turning on mind independence. Um, because obviously in metaethics, there's big issues about uh, realism versus its opposite. And, but there's a different way of cutting that distinction that uh, I think is now sort of a minority position, but that's been really important um, in thinking about it, uh, uh, the distinction between the realism and its opposite as depending on representational content or possibly as inference supporting uh, the capacity of the discourse uh, to support inferences. Okay. Um, and those two don't line up nicely together. Um, so w which two is it again? I'm so sorry, my, my one, one casting the distinction is turning on mind independence right. versus mind right. dependence. The other is turning on uh, with a sort of human idea of having representational content or lacking it. Okay. Um, and the, the, I've, I've sort of favored the latter. And one reason is that it seems to me to leave space for a distinctive form of realism, which is one that is occluded uh, when you cut the distinction as you do. Uh, with that third of the three principles that the facts in question survive right. or, or exist in a world in which there's no persons or concept mongers or right. anything like that. Um, the place of that that's omitted is a place for sort of Rawlsian-style constructivism in which you have normative facts um, that um, aspire to a form of realism with respect to supporting uh, inferences and so forth. Uh, that n and that nonetheless would not exist without concept mongers and uh, judges and participants in the practices which give rise to these. Um, so it right. seems to me that the first way of understanding the distinction includes that, because those wouldn't exist. Right. Right. Uh, justice would not exist in a world in which there were no uh, <coughs> agents making judgments about justice. The latter way of understanding the distinction allows that. It just says, yeah, the, these things wouldn't they wouldn't survive in a world that did none of those. Right, or that but had in any world in which but there it were. Can, it, it does outrun the particular judgments that anyone makes at any given time. So right. it provides for a form of objectivity that doesn't have that sort of transcendent form. So I, I, I'd be interested in what that you think about the, that different um, way of casting. I, would, uh, <laughs> I must admit, I, you know, I'm, I'm not a meta-ethicist, and, and, and I'm uh, pretty naive in, uh, in, in those things. So uh, I, I'd love to, you know, pursue that some more and... and, and, and Figure out how to, you know, say what, how we can make sense out of something's being objectively a practical requirement, even if uh, you know there are no people around. That be yeah. Thanks. Uh, this is tough because we've got two minutes, so we need both a question and an answer that are kind of short. No. All right, I, I didn't think a philosopher could ask a short question. <laughs> Bill, thank you so very much.